We're starting a series on the anatomy of an oil field. How do oil fields work? How do we get oil out of the ground and what are the steps involved? Uh, today's episode we're going to actually look at, well, how do oil fields actually get charged up? How do you fill them over geological time? So stay tuned and we'll come back at the end. In the series we highlight just one aspect of the story at a time. And uh, if you want to get a better overview, then contact us about a, a training course. The field specifics don't really matter. However, we do have to introduce some of the basic story. The field is the Murchison Field, and it's in the northern North Sea sector. It straddles the UK-Norwegian median line. Here's a picture of the platform. You can see the top sides here and uh, the jacket underneath, and here's the, uh, the big flare boom. This is the drilling derrick here. Here's a map of the field at, at top reservoir level, and we can see that this is the high, and here's a, a graben, and we can see that it's a tilted fault block, essentially. This field was one of the fields that was awarded a Best Practice Award back in around about 1999 by the Department of Trade and Industry for some of the work you're going to see presented in this series. Here's a list of the companies involved in the field at the time and you can see some very very large names now they were known by different names back in those days and in fact Kerr McGee and an enterprise have been subsumed into a other corporations since. But this is based on a, a paper that was given at the PESGB in Aberdeen back in January 2000. I'd certainly like to acknowledge the work of my co-workers uh, Steve Burford, Phil King and Nikolai Sedakovic. What will we learn in this video? Well, we're really going to start with a source rock that is mature and it's expelling hydrocarbons. And we're going to look really at the migration history of that. How does oil fill a geologic structure? And from that model, we make some predictions. And in today's video, we're going to actually look how a well was drilled to test one of those predictions. Here's a location map in more detail. And you can see there's the location of the platform in the middle of the field. The Murchison field over to the west you can see the Thistle field, Playfair to the north and over in the Norwegian sector we can see the the Delta field. This is the theoretical limit of how far can be drilled from the platform rig and indeed uh, there has been development of the Playfair and uh, the, the Delta field and there are potential future satellites that uh, could come into play. Here's a look at the uh, structure. Here's a, a, a cross section. It's taken here in the um, in the southwest corner of the Murchison field, running essentially from north northwest down to south southeast. And um, we can see the here's the structure, various layers within the uh, Brent sequence, this um, Middle Jurassic reservoir, uh, and you can see some complex structuration going on here, and a downthrown flank which uh, we'll come back to. This red horizon here is the top of the reservoir, which happens to be the top of the Brent group, which is a middle Jurassic sandstone sequence. And this green event is the uh, the top of the underlying Dunlin shales. The, the oil sits here. There is a, a regional uh, field-wide uh, oil water contact uh, on, on one side of it, but then on the on the downthrown flank here on the southern end of the field we can see that there are these fault blocks where the oil is a lot deeper than in the main field. Having a look at the stratigraphy here, uh, this is all collectively known as the uh, the Brent group here and, and here's the underlying Dunlin shale. Uh, what we can see is that we, we can see various subdivisions of the uh, the Brent group. You can see the sort of thicknesses, typical thicknesses of each of these formations within the field typical range of permeabilities that we get and we can see orders of magnitude difference and the sort of distribution of the oil in place uh, within these various units. So uh, clearly the, uh, the, the Etiv formation is a very, very prolific reservoir, but as is this um, underlying RANIC, uh, 252 million barrels, and uh, this is a, at a much lower permeability generally uh, in the field than the overlying sequences. 
So how do we fill such a structure with oil? Well, simplistically, oil floats on water. So you would expect that uh, oil would actually move to the uh, to the top of the reservoir and fill from the top on down. It's the simple model is that it would basically fill up from these top sands all the way down. Now, there may be different timings and, and if there are barriers within here, we, we may get some slight differences over time as these fill. It might be that the etive fills very much quicker than some of the... Um, some of the more discontinuous sands that we we find here in the uh, within the nest sequence so let's look at the evolution of the source rock the source rock is a upper jurassic kimridge clay formation organic rich source rocks and the timing of the source rock becoming mature is from late cretaceous to the present early uh, maturation here in this deepest graben but most of this oil would actually make its way over to the southeast then we see in these the deepest areas here we see oil being matured and uh, expelled some of it makes its way towards the uh, the thistle field and some of it would make its way firstly into this playfair accumulation of uh, a down dip field here then leak its way in and fill up right to the crest of the murchison field and in time fill the rest of the structure up now we do know that there are a number of wells that have been drilled over to the west to test structures over here we see that uh, they're dry holes, so such implying uh, that there is a migration shadow. So that even though we've got an oil field here, an oil field here, in between, these structures have been dry. Now, on the eastern side of Murchison, we know we've got the, uh, the delta oil field, and that had been tested. But the question was, would we have a migration shadow in between these two, or... Would we get a situation where we would have fill and spill? The delta field actually could have been um, filled by spill from Murchison uh, across, which meant that potentially this feature here could actually be an oil bearing. We look at the M51. This is where the well was located in this low area between the two fields. And you can see here's the delta, here's Murchison. And this is the location of the M51 well that was drilled. When we look at the results of the well, you can see that indeed there was a significant amount of oil pay here shown on the on the logs. Here's a, a water bearing zone on, underneath in this uh, massive Etive sand, but we can see that the what was found was that the oil firmed um, to the spill point, and it was consistent with this fill and spill charging model. There was indeed no migration shadow, and that was a risk on this prior to drilling. So the learnings from this are: think through the fill history of an oil field or a gas field, and try and come up with a model. What are the implications of the model and what predictions can be made from this? Where would be the best place to, to test some of those predictions? None of this can be done without integration and a multidisciplinary teamwork. Well, thank you for watching today's video. As I say, there's more in the sequence. So uh, the next one we're going to be doing is having a look at uh, production history and what happens in the late life of an oil field. So look forward to seeing you back on our channel before too long.